I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to Psalm 107. Psalm 107. As we focus today on giving thanks, giving thanks to the Lord. I look forward to resuming our, our journey through Romans next week, Lord willing, but we will, we will go into the, the Psalms today and, and see what the Lord says in His, in the, in the very uh, God-written praise. This is how we praise according to God. Psalm 107 is the third of three in a row that begin with the call, the command that we give thanks. And these three psalms, uh, 105, 106, and 107, of course, recount reasons that it's appropriate to give thanks to God, recount His blessings. And this one also does so, but it is unique in that there is a pattern that I want you to see as we read this psalm, a pattern uh, that includes the problem of people because of weakness and, and sin and rebellion, uh, the cry for God's help from people, God's grace in responding, and then the call for thanksgiving in light of that response. We see that pattern four times uh, in the first 20, uh, 32 verses, and then verses 33 to 43 describes God's work and how he is able to redeem the re redemption is an excellent word here because he is able to redeem situations and and turn them around and then we end this psalm with a call to consider the wisdom of God whoever is wise uh, let him attend to these things let them consider and what we're called to consider is actually the steadfast love of the Lord so let's read this psalm 107 1 to 43, and then see what we find here as we turn our hearts toward the Lord in thanksgiving. Psalm 107. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom He has redeemed from trouble, and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to, to a city to dwell in, hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for His steadfast love, for His wondrous works to the children of man. For He satisfies the longing soul. And the hungry soul he fills with good things. Some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons, for they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed their hearts down with hard labor. They fell down with none to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. Let them thank the Lord for His steadfast love, for His wondrous works to the children of man. For He shatters the doors of bronze and cuts in two the bars of iron. Some were fools through their sinful ways and because of their iniquities suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them from their distress. He sent out His word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Let them thank the Lord for His steadfast love, for His wondrous works to the children of man, and let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of His deeds and songs of joy. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, His wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven, they went down to the depths, their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wits' end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them 
from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. And they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. He turns rivers into a desert, springs of water into thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salty waste because of the evil of its inhabitants. He turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water. And there he lets the hungry dwell, and they establish a city to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. By his blessing they multiply greatly, and he does not let their livestock diminish. When they are diminished and brought low through oppression, evil, and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes and makes them wander in trackless wastes. But he raises up the needy out of affliction and makes their families like flocks. The upright see it and are glad, and all wickedness shuts its mouth. Whoever is wise, let him attend to these things. Let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord. Father, I come to you now and I pray that by your Holy Spirit you will illuminate our hearts and minds to the truth of your word. And I pray, Lord, that you will draw us to yourself, showing us how wonderful and appropriate it is to give thanks to you. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. This is a wonderful, wonderful psalm in that we see four different patterns here. And I want to call your attention to this uh, before we go back to the command in verse 1. Let's focus on uh, the, the middle part of each of these four repetitions, these four examples. First of all, look in verses 6 to 8. And I want you to note these words there. They cried. He delivered he led. Do you see that? See that pattern? They cried. He delivered. And he led them. And then there's something that's appropriate after that. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Now look in verses 13 to 15. They cried. He delivered. He brought them out of darkness burst their bonds let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love now look in verses 19 to 21 they cried he delivered he sent out his word and healed them and delivered them let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love for his wondrous works to the children of men verses 28 to 31 they cried he delivered he made the storm be still he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. It is not difficult. It is not a difficult assignment to look for evidence that we ought to be thankful. It is recorded for us in the biblical record. It is obvious to us in our very existence right now. We are living and breathing because of His goodness to us. James tells us that every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation of turning. Listen, if you have something good, it is a gift from God. Anything in your life that you have that is good is a gift from God. That is the claim of God. He is the one who made us. He made everything and if there's something good, it's from Him. For example, if you like weekends, you should thank God. He built that into His law. That was His idea. If you like weekends, and I would say, I don't know that I've ever met anybody that doesn't. Maybe there are people who work weekends or something like that, and they wouldn't follow. But if our culture likes weekends, there have been songs written about it. That was God's idea. If you have a family relationship that you, that you love, that means a lot to you, that was God's idea. 
If you have a spouse, you have parents, if you know them, uh, that was God's doing. He chose the family. He, he instituted the family. Whatever you have that's good, that came from God. But we're zeroing in here on his redemption, on his deliverance. And we are introduced to a concept, the thing most for which we are to thank the Lord here, that we're directed to mostly here. Looking back in the command in verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For, or you could say because, his steadfast love endures forever. Now that's the sum of this psalm. Everything else that happens in Psalm 107 is to support that command and the reason given. It's examples. We have examples here. There are examples. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Now I want to think just for a moment about that steadfast love. And it is referenced in each of those four patterns or stanzas uh, with the pattern of the problem of, of the need for deliverance, the cry for deliverance, God's providing deliverance, and then the call for thanksgiving in light of that. Steadfast love is referenced there in each time. And then we end the psalm, let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord. That's what will determine if you put your heart toward the Lord today. If you, if you, will you consider that? We're being exhorted to do that. Let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord. I'm inviting, exhorting, beseeching us to consider the steadfast love of the Lord. Now, the word for steadfast love is a Hebrew word called kesed. And it's translated in some, uh, in some versions as loving kindness. But a study on the word has helped me a lot. The, the root idea behind this word for steadfast love is strong or strength, to be strong, to be loyal, to be faithful. And it denotes strong, loyal, faithful love toward the heirs of the covenant. This actually includes vengeance against their enemies. When we read this love, this steadfast love, this chesed that we're called to give thanks to the Lord for, it is his faithfulness to be who he is and to do what he has said he's going to do. That's what the word means. He is going to do what he has said he is going to do. And he will not allow anyone to stand in the way of that. He will not allow Satan to interfere with that. He will not allow unbelievers to interfere with that. He will not allow armies that are assembled to fight against the Lord and His anointed, the Messiah. He will not allow it because He has hissed toward His people and toward His covenant. He is strong, He is able, and He is loyal, and He is faithful. And there is no possible end to to his plans except that they be accomplished according to his plans. I want to show you uh, what I'm talking about. Look in Psalm 136. Psalm 136. This psalm is, it repeats this word, steadfast love or chesed over and over again. Back in August, we read this psalm at the beginning of our service and we did it as a as a uh, responsive reading and the congregation said over and over for his steadfast love endures forever for his steadfast love endures forever but I want you to show you how we the, the, uh, an excellent illustration that steadfast love points to his strong loyal faithfulness to his covenant let's see what he says here in verse 10 to him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt. His step, because, because his steadfast love endures forever. That doesn't sound very loving, does it? And if, and if we translate that as loving kindness, there's not a lot of loving kindness, it doesn't seem, that's going toward the Egyptians. Look down in verse 17. 
to him who struck down great kings. He struck them down. And in verse 18, and killed mighty kings for his steadfast love or his loving kindness endures forever. That's, that's something that's kind of puzzling until we understand what the word means. Because of his strong and loyal faithfulness to do what he said, he will kill kings to bring it about when they oppose him. He does not arbitrarily kill, but when those kings set themselves against him and put themselves in his way in bringing about his covenant, he will do that. That's how strong, that's how faithful, that's how loyal he is. And that's why Satan has never had a chance in his rebellion against God. Because he's strong and he's loyal and he is faithful. And we read that all throughout Scripture. This is what we thank God for, that, that he has steadfast love to do what he said he's going to do. Now, there's another descriptor here about the Lord, about Yahweh. Look at the end of verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Now, that's really important. That's really important. God is strong and faithful and loyal to do what he has said he's going to do. And it's really good news for us that he is by his nature good. He does not kill where killing is not right. He does not strike down outside of his justice because he's good. He is good. The only people that have to fear God in the, His strong, faithful, loyal covenant-keeping are sinners. But now that brings us to a problem, doesn't it? Because who are sinners? All of us. All of us. But God, in His steadfast love, has covenanted to save sinners. God in his promises to Abraham and David and in the new covenant has promised to save sinners he has promised Abraham you'll be a blessing to all the earth, all the families of the earth god has determined to do this god has not determined to observe all the people and to allow all the good people into heaven and all the bad people cast into hell because there are no good people in order to demonstrate who he is, in order to be faithful and loyal to who he is, not only is he righteous, but he is also gracious and merciful. Those things are good. I see the good in that. Of course, I'm on the side of the sinner who needs that grace and mercy, but I see that as a good thing. God saves because he is good, and he can save because he is strong and faithful and loyal to save, to do what he said he is going to do. Now consider the plight of the people in these. In the, well, before we do that, a, a, a great, some great help on this nuance of give thanks to the Lord. When you look at the word in Hebrew, it comes from a root word that means to throw or cast, yada. And the, the, the Hebrew lexicon that I was reading posited that the, the, the Hitpael version of that, and don't worry about that, but the, the form of this verb uh, in the imperative came to mean to give thanks probably because of the gestures that would be involved in expressing massive gratitude to God. Perhaps hands thrown up perhaps bowing down casting oneself down this is what we're called to do and the other thing that's interesting is that that in and of itself it's it doesn't it can't just be inherently related to being thankful it's more than that it's it's uh, confessing acknowledging as opposed to the word that we get, you, you know the word hallelujah, the, the Hebrew word behind that halal. That means to, uh, 
to, rec- to uh, acclaim or boast in or glory in, that word would be more about when we list his attributes and say they're good. The giving of thanks is the part, that's a response. It's a response. You don't have to, word, have to have the word thanks in here to accurately translate is what I'm saying, but thanksgiving has to be a part of it or you don't understand the situation. And that's why it's translated in English, give thanks. Because that phrase, if you're doing that, that means you understand, you've acknowledged, you've confessed that you need God. And so it's appropriate to translate it, give thanks. Give thanks to the Lord. Now let's look at these examples. Look at these examples. Some wandered in desert wastes, in verse 4, finding no way to a city to dwell in, hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Probably, this is, uh, among many possibilities, this could be a reference that what's found in Deuteronomy 32.10, a recounting of the, the history of Israel. But what we need to understand here is that there are actually, in some of these instances, more than one episode in the history of Israel that could be the concrete, tangible event or of events that caused the psalmist to to put this down like this there are recorded times when there was wandering in desert wastes going on of course the main one would be after the exodus the wilderness wanderings and God led them they cried to the Lord he delivered them now what's appropriate what's appropriate the only thing appropriate is that they thank the Lord for his steadfast love for his chesed do you see how that differs from the for example the prayer of the Pharisee in Luke 18 do you see how that differs when the Pharisee prayed God I thank you that I'm not like this other man over here what did they thank the Lord for they thank the Lord for his steadfast love they didn't thank the Lord that they had, they had taken the resources available to them and built up a great resume to offer him and say, look at us, we deserve your blessing. They just thanked him for his faithfulness to his own promises. That's a recognition of grace. The second example, they sat in darkness in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons. Specifically, this could very well refer to the Babylonian exile or even the Assyrian. But we have in 2 Kings 24.10 through 25.21 the description of the taking away and putting into prison. You could read that passage and, and see, put into prison. Perhaps that is, a, is the reference, but it is a reference to a time when those who were at least physically a part of Israel had experienced that very thing. And some of them in Babylon, for example, cried to the Lord in their trouble. And the result was He delivered them. He is so faithful to do what He does that He tells about it before it happens. You know that the Babylonian exile was announced to Israel, uh, to Judah, before it happened, right? The prophet Jeremiah told them how long it would last, 70 years. The prophet Isaiah told them who would deliver them from it. The prophecy included, you'll be sent away because of your, your sinful rebellion, your idolatry. You'll serve the king of Babylon for 70 years, but you'll cry out to God from there. And Isaiah said, he'll send Cyrus, the king of Persia. Now this was 100 or 150 years or so before Cyrus was born. But that's what Isaiah said would happen, and that's exactly what happened. But the point is, that's how faithful God is to himself and to his promises. It is not, his faithfulness is not contingent on our behavior. Praise the Lord. As a matter of fact, he has given specific promises, as in the Babylonian exile example. He has given specific promises to redeem his people from their stubbornness and their failure and their sin. That's what he's doing. 
That is salvation. And he's purposed to save. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. I praise the Lord for that. He not only does that physically in the Babylonian exile, but he does it spiritually every time he regenerates a dead soul to spiritual life. Look at the third example. Some were fools through their sinful ways and because of their iniquities suffered affliction. This could be the account of, of their... Uh, the, when, when God sent serpents among them because of their rebellion against Him, it could be a reference to that. They suffered affliction from these snakes. To the point they loathed any kind of food, they drew near to the gates of death. They were done. But they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them. Now, in a situ situation like that, the reason they had the affliction, and even if we're not talking about that uh, passage in Numbers, if that's not in mind, it very well could be. But in our text here, they're suffering affliction because of what? Their iniquities. Their sinful ways. They ought to be suffering. None of us can say, well, we ought not to be suffering. We can't make that claim. We're all sinners. We're all born sinners. We can't say we deserve to be saved. Can't make that claim. And yet, this is who God is. He has determined to redeem a people for Himself. Not even their rebellion will stop Him from doing so. Their suffering was due to their own sin and iniquity. They cried to the Lord, and He delivered them. Now, a lot of times in thinking of God and His sovereignty and salvation, it comes up, well, that's just not fair. Now, if we want to talk about fair, here's something that's not fair, right? The reason there's suffering is because of rebellion and iniquity and sin. And if God were going to carry out justice, and that's all he were about, there wouldn't be any deliverance. This line in here, he delivered them, wouldn't be in there. It would just say, and justice was served. But God is a God of grace. If you're looking for motive, a motivation for thanksgiving to God, here it is. <laughs> Whatever plight you're in, individually, specifically, you're in it because you're a sinner and you live in a world of sinners. And it's going to be bad. It's going to be some bad stuff for sinners living in a world of sinners. Described as a place that is ruled by the God of this age, the prince of the power of the air, Satan. There's bad things going on. But they cried to the Lord. He delivered them. That makes me think of Romans 10, 13. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, in these four examples, even though we, we're seeing that, well, they're in the situation they're in because of their own doing, their own failure, their own sin. We don't have a single time here in these four examples where it says they cried to the Lord and He said, just forget it you're on your own we don't have any time in all of scripture where someone begged God for mercy on his terms and they were refused it that just doesn't happen and the reason for that is sinners don't even cry to the Lord for deliverance unless he graciously shows them their need and that he is the only savior they cried and he delivered. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love. Remember that thank is not just to say, let's have a prayer, somebody lead it, and somebody say, thank you, Lord. That's not, that's not summing up the word here. It's not even to try to send God a thank you card. It is a response of the heart. It, and it, it, the word itself is take the word is what it is for this probably because of gestures involved in surrender in confession in acknowledgement that he's the one worthy he is the one worthy of honor and glory it's a heart response 
It's not words off the lips merely. It's not a day in November. It's a heart, re- it's spontaneous. It's what happens when prisoners are freed, when the, when the bars of iron are cut in two. You don't have to work that up. You don't have to study for a while and think, how should I respond to this? I've been in dark prison dungeon here, and somebody has freed me. Let's see, what is the proper response? We don't have to think about that. The only question is, have you experienced this? That's all we're talking about. And if you have, are you setting your mind on this reality and not letting everything else crowd it out? You don't have to, you don't have to drum up Thanksgiving. It, it just happens. It's cast. It's thrown. Isn't that awesome? Doesn't that instruct us to look into His Word and see that's what the Word means? To throw and cast. That's what it is. The last pattern. Some went down to the sea in ships doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord. His wondrous works in the deep. But look what happened. He commanded and raised the stormy wind. Now this could be an account from Jonah. From Jonah's life. And the point is not that we need to make sure we match up these words with the actual event that the psalmist had in his mind what we need to understand is that there are events that truly happen in history that the psalmist can think of and when he does sum it up with examples that's what we need to see now look what happened to them the the stormy wind lifted up the waves of the sea they mounted up to heaven went down to the depths on this ship their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. And by the way, their cold courage melted away in their evil plight. They were at their wits' end. And they cried to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them from the distress. Well, how did he do that? He made the storm be still. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad that the waters were quiet. See that? They didn't take a class. How to respond to the waters being quiet? They were glad. He brought them to their desired haven. That's what God did. We have a New Testament account that sounds very similar, don't we? In Matthew 8, Luke 8, it's recorded. And it was not lost on the disciples. Often, often things that Jesus taught were lost on the disciples. This is not one of those cases. When you go and read Matthew 8, Luke 8, the account of Jesus calming the sea. They were glad that they didn't perish in the storm. But their fear didn't go away. It got transferred. They were stunned and amazed because they realized We're in a boat with God. What manner of man is this that even the winds and waves obey him? They knew the story of Jonah. They knew that in their Bibles, the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, God controls the sea. And they had just seen Jesus do that. What manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? What a wonderful verse right here. Verse 30, he brought them to their desired haven. I know that you're tempted. I know that it's likely that you're tempted when you're going through a difficult circumstance to just look at that moment and say, the sea's too high. I can't do that. I, I, I cannot stand this. I cannot survive this. That was the case for this situation. There was nothing for them to do but cry to the Lord. But eventually, he made the storm be still. And the ending is, he brought them to their desired haven. He brought them to their desired haven. That's what God does. 
So don't be discouraged. He's got a schedule. It's perfect. Of course, I know what yours and mine is. It's, okay, Lord, deliverance, and now. I want this to stop now. I don't want to ever have to deal with this again right now. Please. I can't stand it. But he has a schedule. He's at work. He's doing something. But the end result is certain. The end result is certain. You will end up in your desired haven when you cry to the Lord and put yourself in his hands. When you put yourself in his hands, he'll bring you where he wants you to be. And if you're depending on him and you come to him on his terms and beg for mercy, you get it and you get to the desired haven. You get there. It might not be in this moment or in the next ten moments. But you end up there. That's where you end up. God doesn't say, I won't ever let you go through anything that makes you afraid. I won't ever think, let you go through anything that makes you feel threatened. But he will get you to the desired haven. You know why? Because of his kissed his steadfast love because he is strong and he is loyal and he is faithful to do what he says he will do and he will not allow kings or armies to stop him and get in the way of that listen i don't rejoice in the death of the firstborn of egypt in and of that act but i rejoice that the mightiest nation on earth at that time their leader could not stop God from displaying His power and delivering His people. And he had, Pharaoh had lots of opportunities before that last one, didn't he? He was instructed over and over, Pharaoh, let my people go. You see, God has steadfast love for His people. And when He decides they're not staying in Egypt, they're not staying. Now the lesson right there for us besides that we give thanks as his people is that you don't need to oppose God. He will not alter his covenant to accommodate your preferences. He won't do it for Pharaoh. He won't do it for Caesar. And he won't do it for you. For you and any army. He won't do it. What he has said he will do he will do and that's his steadfast love now we have to see the call for thanksgiving at the end of each of these uh, patterns these these stanzas verse 8 verse 15 verse 20 and verse 31 are all the same thing word for word let them thank the lord for his steadfast love for his wondrous works to the children of man now there's a couple things about that we're being exhorted to thank the Lord. But again, it's not that, that they're trying to set up some seminars to figure out, you know, what the appropriate response is. They're just, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's calling for the appropriate response, for the spontaneous response. It would be sinful and wrong not to thank the Lord. Let them thank the Lord for His steadfast love. Now, the other thing that I praise the Lord for here is the the... The foreshadowing, foreshadowing or the accommodation here of the mystery of the New Testament, which is that the Gentiles are included in the New Covenant. The Gentiles are included in the people that God is redeeming for Himself. Because even though there's lots of things that are specific to the people in history of Israel right here, this repeated exhortation to thanksgiving acknowledges this. Let us thank the Lord for his let, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love for his wondrous works to the children of man. This is a this is a, an announcement that God is good to everyone in the world. God is is his, he has, he's God everywhere and he's the only savior anywhere. And it's appropriate that thanksgiving be given to God everywhere in the world. Because he's done wondrous works to the children of man. Good things to everybody. And his plan was, as announced in Isaiah 49, 5 and 6. It is too light a thing, God says to the Messiah, to his servant, that you restore Israel in the house of Judah. 
I will make you a light to the nations that my salvation may go to the ends of the earth. That's, that's why it's wonderful to get to support the Lottie Moon Christmas offering for international missions. It is impossible that God's salvation will not reach to the ends of the earth. In the book of Revelation, you read chapter 5, you will discover that there are people around the throne from every people group on earth. You know why that's going to happen? Because of God's chesed. Because of His strong, faithful love for Himself, for His covenant, and for His covenant people. And He knows who they are. The Lord knows His own. And He goes and gets them. Now that's four examples. In the end of this psalm, we have an excellent, wonderful description of redemption. What redemption is. He, tur he turns something around. He flips it. It makes me think of uh, Luke 16. How, how Jesus telling the story says, in the story says that Father Abraham reminded the rich man who had died and gone to hell that in your life you were comforted and you had everything you wanted. And Lazarus had nothing. But now you are in torment and he he is blessed. Do you remember that the Lord Jesus said, so the last will be first and the first last, recorded in multiple occasions in the New Testament? Let's look at how that happens here. Look in verse 33. He turns rivers into a desert and springs of water into a thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salty waste because of the evil of its inhabitants. There's his justice. There's his justice. You want to see his grace? Look at the next one. He turns a desert into pools of water and a parched land into springs of water. And there he lets the hungry dwell and they establish a city to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. By his blessing they multiply greatly and he does not let their livestock diminish. Now in this passage, who is the one acting? It's God, isn't it? He turns rivers into a desert. He turns a desert into pools of water. He is the one who redeems. He is the one who reverses. He is the one who acts. That's what redemption is. This is not a celebration of the accomplishments of man. This is a, this is a celebration of the accomplishments of God on behalf of man. That's why thanksgiving ought to be part of the normal fabric of our lives. Verse 39, when they are diminished and brought low through oppression, evil, and sorrow. And let me, just, let me just say, we have brothers and sisters around the world right now, and you know what they are? They are diminished and they're brought low through oppression, evil, and sorrow. That's going on. That's going on right now. But here's what God does. He pours contempt on princes and makes them wander in trackless wastes. You see, the oppressors... The, the haters of God eventually are going to experience the wrath of God. And it may be that there is an interim when they're carrying out their persecution, when the people of God are suffering and, and, and crying out to God and being forced to cry out to God. And I think that's the point of suffering, to drive us to God, to teach us our dependence on Him. But eventually, He's going to pour contempt on princes. Those that hate his people, those that hate him. And so what does he do? He raises up the needy out of affliction and makes their families like flocks. The blessing comes to his people. And his people are not his people because they've earned it, but because he has set his love on them and covenanted with himself, primarily and with them, to redeem them for himself. And so... He raises them up. Raises up the needy out of affliction. Makes me think of a, a passage in the New Testament, Ephesians 2. He seats them in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's what He does for His people. You can have earthly ambition. You can make your way up the ladder of success until you are a prince. But if you oppose God, He's going to pour contempt on you. And the lowliest and the neediest... Well, 
turns out they've been seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. The upright see it and are glad. Do you see this? Do you see this? Do you see the deliverance, the redemption? Are you throwing and casting thanksgiving to God as a result? Do you see it? That's the only question. Are you glad? If you don't see it and are glad, then any, any empty words of thanksgiving are going to be received by God is that do you see it are you glad all wickedness shuts its mouth there's nothing that evil can do to stop this because of God's steadfast love whoever's wise here's here's our final closing exhortation let him attend to these things this is what your life ought to be about this is what you ought to be pursuing the glory of God giving thanks to him living for him because of what he's done that is what your life ought to be about that's what your life is about or you're an idolater Psalm 111.10 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom are you wise? do you fear the Lord? let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord. We started with, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. We have examples of His steadfast love, description of His steadfast love, and now we have this closing exhortation. Let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord. God is God. He is good. He is faithful to His covenant. He has decided in His infinite wisdom to redeem a people for Himself. And because of that, we can be saved. Because God has chosen to save. He's faithful and loyal and strong enough to be so to His purposes, His promises, His covenant. Do you consider that? This doesn't mean consider it and then move on to another topic. This means your life is characterized by an awareness and acknowledgement. Remember what the verb means. Give thanks. You are throwing and casting. You are spontaneously responding to God's blessings and His steadfast love with thanksgiving. And that is what governs your words and your actions. That's a true love for God. This refers to love for God. You cannot claim to love God and not have this thanksgiving response to him let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord now we're about to we're about to celebrate the Lord's table the Lord's supper and I want to I want to read to you the the gospel events how is it that God has redeemed a people for himself 1 Corinthians 15 1 through 4 says now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast or cling to the word, to the message I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. In other words, unless it was empty, unless it was just, it's thanksgiving, I'm thankful, and that's as far as it goes. Words on your lips, that's not enough. Unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. I want to tell you something. If it hits you a little wrong when we read that out of His steadfast love, God struck down the firstborn of Egypt. If it hits you a little bit wrong that out of His steadfast love, God killed mighty kings... I want you to know that God in not allowing even sinful rebellion of man to keep him from bringing about his intended purposes, God the Father poured out his wrath on God the Son. In order to have 
steadfast love, God the Son died. Jesus died. In the incarnation, He died. God the Son experienced that for us. Do you see that there is no limit to what God will do in order to be faithful to His covenant? His covenant includes justice. This says Christ died for our sins. The justice of God carried out and satisfied by Jesus' death. That's why he could say, it is finished. He was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Let me tell you, death is an ultimate and powerful and undefeatable foe for us, but not for God. Do you know that death threatens, has risen up against God's purpose to redeem a people for Himself who will glorify Him and enjoy His glory forever? Death threatens that. What did God do? He conquered death. Why? Because of His steadfast love. There is nothing that can raise itself up against and in opposition to God because of His steadfast love. It cannot be. He will not allow it to be. Why do we preach Jesus as the only of salvation? Because He's the only one who has conquered death, hell, and the grave for us. Because He is God the Son. He is the God-man. In Him, the justice of God is satisfied. In Him, the mercy and grace of God are distributed. In no one else is that true. Can that be said of them? This is who Jesus is. This is what we celebrate at the Lord's table. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to accomplish God's eternal purpose to redeem a people for Himself. If you're a part of that people, which means you see this and you're glad and you say, that's what I've got to have. i got to have Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I want to worship God and obey Him no matter what happens in my life. If you're trusting in Christ, and that's another way to say it, to see it and be glad, say, yes, I affirm this, I pursue this, I want this, I desire this, then that salvation. Now, I want to, as we prepare uh, to receive the, the suffer, I want to read to you from 1 Corinthians 11. I want to invite anyone who's a believer, you have made a public profession of faith in Christ and followed in believers baptism to participate in the Lord's Supper this does not convey saving grace to participate in the Lord's Supper it is a declaration a proclamation of the death of the Lord and I'm going to re begin reading in 1 Corinthians 11 26 to 33 32 rather so that we would heed the warning and examine ourselves to make sure that we're seeing it and are glad and are ready to partake. For as often as you eat this, drink, eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So I encourage you, unless your heart is in rebellion against the Lord, and if it is, then you don't need to participate. But if you yield... If you celebrate and are glad to say, I depend on Jesus, His person, and His work. And I want to join others to celebrate what He's done and remember what He's done. Then you're invited. Ushers, if you'd come forward at this time.